Night and day, at home or away, always carry Tums. T-U-M-S. Tums, famous quick relief for acid indigestion, presents A Date with Judy, starring Louise Erickson as Judy and John Brown as father. Hello. Hello, Judy. This is Oogie. Oogie. I'm absolutely hysterical. You're home. Uh, did you have a good time at your grandmother's? Oh, Oogie, it was dreamy. Jimmy took me to the tennis matches, and Jerry took me sailing, and Freddie took me dancing. I had the most popular week since my girlhood. What did you do while I was away? Oh, nothing much. Oh, yeah, I took Tootsie Whiteman to the movies one night. Oogie and... Pringle, I might have known. Known what? The moment I turn my back, you're unfaithful to me. <laughs> Judy, folks, Judy Foster, the lovable teenage girl who is close to all our hearts. Your date with her each Tuesday is arranged by the makers of Tums, famous quick relief for acid indigestion. Friends, how can you always be sure of almost instant relief from acid indigestion and heartburn? Well, folks, that's easy. Always carry Tums, the handy, friendly roll tucked right in your pocket or purse. Then, at the first hint of acid distress, just slip Tums in your mouth as you would candy mints. Almost instantly, Tums neutralize the troublesome excess acid. Almost instantly, your stomach is soothed, settled, and you feel better. There's no baking soda in Tums, remember. Nothing to over-alkalize your stomach. Nothing to cause acid rebound. No mixing or stirring with Tums either. No water needed. Get your Tums this very night. Still only 10 cents a roll, three roll package a quarter. All drugstores. T-U-M-S. Tums for the tummy. And now to the Fosters. It's evening, shortly after dinner, and Judy's mother and kid brother Randolph sit staring at father. He seems very unhappy. He sighs. <sighs> he groans. Uh. He grunts. Hmm. He speaks. It's no use. I can't do it. I can't do it. Oh, Melvin, don't let it break your heart like that. It's all right, Father. I'm a failure. No, Melvin. A complete and utter failure. Stinky Edwards' father couldn't do it either. Well, I'm not going to give up. Oh, I wish I hadn't asked you to do it. Randolph, if a boy can't ask his own father to help him with his geometry, who can he ask? His teacher. I'll ask her first thing in the morning. No. I'll figure this out if it takes all night. Now, let's see. Given the measurements of two sides of a right-angled triangle... Get Randolph! Yes, Father? In the future, you will spend less time reading comic books and more time studying. But, Father... I shouldn't have to go through this. You should know without my helping you. Why, when I was a boy, Father, I... Father, Mother! What is it, dear? Look what I found in the attic. Look, a painting. Isn't it lovely? Let me see. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Mm, not bad. Let me see it, dear. Oh, dear. What's the matter, Mother? Don't you like it? Yes, I like it very much. Matter of fact, now that I look at it more carefully, I think it's a masterpiece. A masterpiece? This picture of an apple? Oh, come now, Dora. Well, I ought to know. I painted it. <laughs> what? No kidding. Mother. Did you really paint this beautiful picture? Did you really? Yes, I really. But it's beautiful. Really stunningly beautiful. And just think, all this time I've thought of you only as a mother, cook, and housekeeper. Now suddenly you're an artist, too. Oh, you don't know me as well as you think you do, young lady. You mean there's more? There might be. <laughs> don't tell me you do bird calls, too. <laughs> No, I'm afraid not. But, Mother, you painted it with your own two hands. Better than that. I did it with one hand. But when? It must have been centuries ago. Oh, not exactly centuries, Judy. I was a young girl not too many years ago. Oh, I was crazy about painting. Yeah, I remember now. Somebody said you had a lot of talent. I think it was your mother. Oh, a lot of people <laughs> thought I had talent. I even had some lessons. And then what happened, Mother? Well, I sort of gave it up when a certain young man came along. Who? Your father. <laughs> <laughs> father? Uh-huh. <clears throat> you gave up your great talent, your great career for father? Of course. Naturally. Father, how could you? 
Huh? How could I what? Marry mother. What? <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to. That's no excuse. It isn't? Well, I... <clears throat> well, you see, honey, it was because... It, what am I apologizing for? <laughs> well, you should apologize for what you did to mother. I didn't do anything to her. I just married her. Shame on you, father. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm really surprised at you, father. We might have had a genius in the family, a world-famous artist. You hadn't spoiled everything by marrying her. Young lady, did it ever occur to you that there wouldn't have been any family to have a genius in if I hadn't married her? Please, Father, don't quibble. Quibble? <laughs> I didn't know she was a genius. I didn't deliberately plan to deprive her of a career. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure about that, you men. You know what I think? I think that men are afraid of us as competition. So they marry and chain us to a broom to eliminate the competition. What? Why, I did nothing of the sort. In the first place, your mother is not chained to any broom. Of course not. It's a stove. Yes. No. <laughs> Young man... Well, I can tell you one thing. No man is going to do that to me. No, sir. I'm going to cherish and nurture my talent. No man is going to kill it by marrying me. What talent is that? Well, I don't know yet, but... Well, I've always felt that I must have some talent, and now that I know about mother, I'm sure of it. After all, everybody always said that I took after Mother. But, honey... But Father, I'm very fond of you indeed. You know that. But I can't help it. Can't help what? I can't help feeling terribly sorry for poor, poor Mother. But I... Oh, for the love of heaven. Boy, wasn't that a swell picture, Judy? Oh, yes, Dookie. Remember the part where the girl slapped the hero in the face and then he, he grabbed her by the hair and kissed her for about ten minutes? Uh-huh. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, Dookie. Thanks for loving... You're not going in yet, are you? Well, I thought I'd get to be... Oh, it's early. Let's sit on the, on the swing for a while, huh? I... Got a few things to say to you. Well, all right. What did you want to say, Oogie? Well, well, you see, I... Didn't you like the picture? Oh, yes. Especially the love scenes. It was beautiful when he told her that her eyes had a hundred stars in them. Women like it when men describe their various features, don't they? Uh-huh. <clears throat> Judy... Judy, you're beautiful tonight. Astonishingly beautiful. Why, Oogie? Your neck looks just like a swan's, almost. <laughs> Oogie! I'm mad about you, Judy, mad. I think about you all the time, morning, noon, and night, and all through school. Oh, my dearest flower, you are like a petal, twisting my emotions, hither and yon. Oogie, stop talking that way. Stop it this minute. Holy smoke, what's the matter? I want you to stop it. Stop it? When my heart is pouring out every word Cary Grant said? I'm sorry, Yuki. But there's more. I didn't even get to the part where your skin is like cream. I can't listen to another syllable. Why not? Because I've given all that up. What? But before you always complained because I talked too much about spark plugs and axles. And now when I talk... I can't help it. But why? Why? Because I don't intend to be chained to a broom. Huh? I don't want to chain you to a broom. I just want to kiss you. Oh, I know you men. You're all the same. You start out by kissing us, and before we know it, you've got us spending our lives over a hot broom. What's all this about brooms? What's it got to do with my kissing you? Everything. Look at what happened to my mother. She married my father. It's not my fault she married your father. <laughs> if it hadn't been my father, it would have been someone else. You, for instance. Me? Well, how could I marry your mother? She's old enough to be my mother. Don't change the subject. How can I change the subject when I don't even know what the subject is? <laughs> the subject is what you men do to us women. You're afraid to compete with me. I am? About what? You know very well what about what. You know you're just trying to crush my talent. I've seen it happen to my mother, and I don't intend to let it happen to me. Did something happen to your mother? Yes, she married my father. Well, I admit that's a tough break, but why should that bother you now? Because I just found out about it. What? Did you think all along they weren't married? No. <laughs> I mean, I just found out about my mother's talent. You don't know it, Oogie, but my mother was a great painter when she was a girl. 
Really? Yes, a great painter with a brilliant career ahead of her. And then she married my father and gave it up. Oh, that's too bad, but I still don't see what, what that's got to do with you and me. It's very simple, Oogie. You do the same thing to my talents. No, I wouldn't, Judy. I never do a thing like... What talent? <laughs> I don't know yet. It's still dormant. But one of these days, it will emerge. Well, couldn't we kiss until it does? <laughs> no, Oogie. Because when it does, I want to be free to pursue it. I don't want any romantic entanglements to stand in its way. I must keep myself free. You mean it's all off between us? Oh, we can still be friends, Oogie. I still like you very much, but as for anything beyond that, I'm afraid that you will have to look upon me as one from another planet. But, Judy... I you... have spoken. <sighs> And then, Mother, I told Oogie that we could still be friends, but that I definitely intended avoiding the trap that you fell into. Well, Judy, I'd hardly call it a trap that I fell into. What do you mean? Well, I married a wonderful man whom I love very much, and I have two wonderful children. Of course, Father's and... a wonderful man, Mother, and we're wonderful children. But what about your art? Oh, well, Judy, I probably never would have amounted to much as an artist, dear. Mother, don't say that. You yourself said that everybody thought you were a genius. I didn't say genius, dear. Just very talented. But even without it, Judy, I've been very happy. You just think you've been happy, Mother. But tell me the truth. Don't you ever miss painting? Oh, I don't know. But think I... of what you might have been, Mother. A world-renowned artist. The first great woman painter in history. Well, I... Selling pictures I... for fabulous amounts of money. Hung in all the famous art galleries of the world. Yes? Doing portraits of presidents and kings. Meeting all the great men of the day. Of course. Just think of it. You, the 20th century Rembrandt. Now that you mention it, Judy, maybe I did give up a lot when I married your father. <laughs> We are always happy to hear from people like Mrs. Ruby Brown of 1701 7th Avenue North, Birmingham, Alabama, who always relies on tums for pleasant, speedy relief from acid indigestion. Miss Brown writes, I want to put in a word of praise for the wonderfully fast, effective relief tums always bring for acid indigestion and heartburn. Because I like to keep tums in the house as well as in my purse, I always buy the economical three-roll package for a quarter. Thank you, Miss Brown. And friends, try Tums yourself. At the first sign of distress, slip one or two tasty Tums in your mouth as you would candy mints. Almost instantly, Tums neutralize excess acid, soothe and settle your upset acid stomach. There's no baking soda in Tums, absolutely none. No danger of overalkalizing. No risk of acid rebound. Get Tums tonight. Always keep Tums handy. Still only 10 cents a roll, three roll package a quarter, all drugstores. T-U-M-S. Tums for the tummy. And now back to A Date with Judy. Mr. Foster, I hope you don't mind my coming down to your office. Well, of course not, Oogie. What's on your mind? Plenty, Mr. Foster, Plenty. Well, sit down. Tell me about it. All right. Mr. Foster, do you know how Judy and I say goodnight to each other these days? No. We shake hands. <laughs> What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Mr. Foster, your daughter and I... Sit down, Ogie. Thank you. Mr. Foster, I have known your daughter for close on to nine years now. Discounting the time we were mere children, we have known each other as man and woman for four years. So? So it took me three of those four years to get her to the point where she and I used to say goodnight to each other by... Uh, well, to be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Foster, we have not been shaking hands this past year. <laughs> I see. And now what happens? What happens, I ask you? Well, I don't know. Uh, sit down, Ogie. Thank you. I'll tell you what happens... We're now back to shaking hands again. Is that so? Yes, that's so. And do you know why, Mr. Foster? No, I don't. Sit down, Oogie. Thanks. 
I'll tell you why, Mr. Foster. Because you married Mrs. Foster. What? Yes, sir, Mr. Foster. You are responsible for my shaking hands with Judy. What? What are you talking... Oh, I know. You mean Judy's talk of my wrecking Mrs. Foster's great artistic talent. Exactly, Mr. Foster. Well, for goodness sake, Oogie, you're not going to blame me for that, are you? Sit down. Uh, thanks. <laughs> you can't hold that against me. <laughs> Why, I had a perfect right to marry a girl if I loved her. No, sir, Oogie, I refuse to accept the responsibility. Well, I know, Mr. Foster, but well, I'm all upset. Well, the way it is now, I might as well be taking out Randolph for all the good Judy's doing me. Well, I'm very sorry, Oogie, but that's between Judy and yourself. Uh, sit down. Thanks. See, the funny thing is, this is all in Judy's mind. It is? Well, of course. Mrs. Foster is perfectly happy. She's never given her career a second thought. Well, why would she? She's had me. And the, uh, the children, of course, yeah. Oogie, my boy, you've just got to learn how to handle women. Gosh, Mr. Foster, I wish I had your experience. Uh, nothing to it, Oogie. Any advice you'd give me would be cheerfully received. All right, Oogie. The first thing you've got to do is... Yes, Mr. Foster? Sit down! <laughs> I must tell you about something very funny that happened today. <laughs> Oogie came into the office to uh -huh. see me, and it, it seems he had a complaint against a... What's the matter, dear? You sound sort of funny. You feel all right? I'm fine. Oh, good. Well, it, it, it seems that Judy has been very unromantic toward him these days because of her feeling that I ruined your career by marrying you. Oh? <laughs> she told him she's avoiding all romantic entanglements, so she'll be free to pursue her talent when she discovers what it is. <laughs> don't you get it, dear? I get it. But I don't see what the joke is. What? Well, don't you see, Dora? She told me... I don't think it's very funny. But, Dora... If she feels she has a talent and wants to pursue it, well, who's to say which is the right course? What? Talent's a very precious thing, Melvin. Not everyone is fortunate enough to have one. But, Dora, And if dear, a person does uh, happen to have a talent, she feels that romance and marriage will stand in the way of her pursuing that talent. Well, fame and fortune and success are not to be sneered at, you know. Well, but, Dora... Oh, not that I regret having given up my career. But when one thinks of past glories, one can't help but feel a certain emptiness. <laughs> Dora! Just think. I might have hung in all the famous art galleries of the world. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, no. Father, what's the matter? These past few days you've been walking around like a man without oh, a... Oh, I don't know, son. You go along thinking everything is hunky-dory. Suddenly, something you did 20 years ago comes back and hits you right smack in the face. Mm, the talent business, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, what are you going to do about it? What can I do about it? Except go around looking apologetic? If a person had an idea, would you consider an increase in his allowance? Randolph, have you got... Gladly! A dollar? I might. A dollar and a quarter? I'd rather go around looking apologetic. Then shall we say a dollar? Shall we say 75 cents? Shake. Shake. What do we do? Well, first we call Oogie. Uh -huh. Then we'll work it out so that every night... Poor mother. Yes, it's just a shame. Well, never mind, children. It's too late for me. I have so many responsibilities and so little time. But you, Judy, have you felt any inner drives yet, dear? I think so, Mother. Poetry. Oh, Judy, how wonderful. It happened yesterday. I was walking with Mitzi, and suddenly I saw a bird. Immediately, a phrase came into my mind. Oh, would that I were a winged creature with wings spread wide. Yes. Yes? That's all. Oh. <laughs> but I knew at that moment that poetry was to be my life. It's a beautiful line, dear. 
Thank you, Mother. Now stick to it, dear. Don't let anything stand in your way. I won't, Mother. Hello, everybody. Hi, Father. Good evening, Melvin. Good evening, Father. What's in the package? You'll see in just a moment. But uh, first, there's something I want to say. Dora, I've been thinking things over. I mean, about your artistic talent and so on. And I want you to know that I think you're right. Melvin. Why, Father? I, I spoiled your chances by marrying you and tying you down to a house and shelter. <sighs> Now, I want to give you that chance I stole from you. In this package, you will find an easel, a set of paints, and canvas. Now, Dora, paint. <laughs> yeah. Mother, Father has given your career back to you. Oh, I'm so excited. I don't know what to paint first. Now, how about my bicycle? They can sure use it. Randolph, how can you be so inartistic? I shall start composing. If there could but be silence. Oh, I'm very sorry. I won't say another word. Mother, do you know what we're going to do? We are going to devote every minute of our spare time to our individual careers. It is unfortunate that I have to go to school in the daytime. But we'll still have the eventide. Of course. We'll work at night. Every night. We won't go any place or see anyone. We'll just work. Side by side to the dawn. Yes, dear. Melvin, I hope you won't mind being left alone in the evenings. I have so many years to make up for. I understand, dear. Well, I better go upstairs and change my clothes. Change your clothes? What are you going to do? Don't you remember? Tonight's the Emerson's party. Oh. It's a shame that you're going to have to miss it, dear. But then you'll have the dawn. <laughs> of course. Oh, that reminds me. I'd better call Oogie and tell him not to pick me up. We're supposed to go to Mitzi's party. Poor darling, he'll be so disappointed. Hello? Hello, Judy, this is Oogie. Oh, hello, Oogie. I was just going to call you. Uh, about the party tonight, I can't possibly go. You see, I'm in the middle of a poem, and I must... Oh, that's the reason I called, Judy. I've been thinking about what you said, and I've come to the conclusion that you're right. Really? Uh-huh. You should devote all your time to your talent, especially now that you know what it is. So I called to tell you that I already asked Tootsie Whiteman to go to the party with me. Oh. Well, I guess I won't be calling you anymore. Oh, that's so understanding of you, Oogie. A, a person simply cannot create when a phone keeps ringing. Of course not. I'd really like to have it taken out. Yeah, artists shouldn't have phones. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Oogie. Call me tomorrow. <laughs> Randolph, you sure bowled a good game. No, it's nothing. Well, I wasn't so bad, Oogie. <laughs> oh, no, Mr. Foster, no indeed. Hmm. Sounds awful quiet in here. Well, painting pictures and writing poetry are very quiet occupations. Let's see what they've done. Hmm? Well, look, uh, Judy fell asleep on the couch. And Mrs. Foster in the chair. <laughs> they couldn't have been very inspired. Uh, let's see what they created tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's Mother's canvas. Blank. Oh, not quite. Notice her signature in the lower right-hand corner? <laughs> <laughs> not a bad night's work. <laughs> hey, here's the paper Judy was writing. Well, come on out in the hall. Let's see. Oh, would that I were a winged creature with wings spread wide. Yeah? Yes. That's all. <laughs> Except that she wrote it one, two, three, eleven times. And the eleventh time, she wrote it backwards. <laughs> Widespread wings with creature winged, a were I that would owe. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yeah. Judy Foster, Poet Laureate of America. Uh, Judy Foster, Poetess Laureate of America. Judy Foster, Poet Laureatus of America. Uh, Judy Foster, Poetess Laureatus of America. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she certainly covered that subject. <laughs> well, good night, boys. If we're going out every night while genius is at work, I'd better get some sleep. I sure hope you can stand the pace, Father. Well, fellas, what'll it be tonight? How about the movie at the Bijou? I hear it's wonderful. Good idea. Let's go. So long, girls. So long. A better luck tonight, Mother. Same to you, Judy. I hope you get that second line tonight. Thank you. Good night. Night. Good night. Good night. Well, I better get to work. Let's see, where was I? 
Oh, would that I were a winged... Mother, where are you going? Melvin, wait! Wait for me! What's the matter, Dora? What's the trouble? I want to see that movie. Mother, how could you? No. No, Dora, I couldn't let you do it. What about your painting? And, and, and career? I spoiled it for you once. I couldn't do it again. Melvin, you've been out every single night this week having fun while I've been painting apples. I want to have some fun, too. <laughs> well, if you're sure you won't feel that... Father, you, you mustn't tempt Mother like that. What about her talents? Well, I'll tell you, Judy. Just because your mother has talent, there's no reason why she can't live a normal life. Matter of fact, talent can usually be better expressed when a person is leading a normal life. But, Father... Anyway, Judy, one genius in the family is enough, dear, and you can be it. Well, I certainly intend to. I certainly do. My talent is much too important to just throw it away simply because I miss a good time. The only thing is... Yeah? I've decided not to be a poet. No. Judy! No kidding. It's no use trying to dissuade me. I made up my mind. Poets never become famous until after they're dead, and I can't wait that long. <laughs> I see what you mean. I have decided to switch careers. I shall continue to write, but from now on... Yeah? I'm going to write for the movies. The movies? Yes. So, purely in the interest of my career, I shall be glad to accept your kind invitation to the Bijou tonight. Come on, Judy. <laughs> Dora, don't let anyone ever tell you we haven't got one genius in the family. <laughs> more from the Fosters in a moment. You know, the better you sleep, the better you feel. So never let a bedtime spell of acid indigestion keep you awake. Steal your sleep, ruin your rest. Take Tums. Yes, before you slip into bed, slip a couple of tasty Tums in your mouth, same as you would candy mints. Almost instantly, Tums neutralize the excess acid, soothe and settle your stomach. Smooth the way to a refreshing night's sleep. Nothing to mix or stir with Tums. And Tums contain no baking soda, absolutely none. So no danger of over-alkalizing, no waking with acid rebound. Friends, sleep right every night, undisturbed by acid indigestion. Get Tums this very evening. Still only 10 cents a roll, three roll package, just a quarter, all drugstores. There are many imitations, but no substitute for Tums. T-U-M-S. Genuine Tums for the Tummy. And now, here are Judy and Oogie. How, oh, Oogie, isn't it a beautiful night? Yeah. Well, good night, Judy. But, Oogie, it isn't late. Don't you want to sit on the swing and talk? No, i got to get up early and work on my car. You see, the spark plugs Oh, are... I deserve this. Huh? I treated you shamefully. I didn't appreciate you when you were romantic. Now, Judy... You'll probably never tell me that you're mad about me again. Sure I will, Judy. It's just that my spark plugs... You'll never say that my eyes have stars in them. Judy, you don't understand. When a fella's got dirty spark plugs... I do understand, Judy. I just hope that someday you will find it in your heart to forgive me. Good night. Judy, wait a minute. Yes, Oogie? I... I'm mad about you. How, oh, Oogie? And not only that... I like you, too. <laughs> oh, Oogie, that's the most beautiful thing you've ever said to me. What else? What else? Yes, go on. I got a leaky carburetor, too. <laughs> a Day's of Judy is written by Elaine Leslie and stars Louise Erickson as Judy and John Brown as father with Dick Davis as Randolph and Myra Marsh as mother. Dick Crenna played Oogie. Music was composed and conducted by Hal Bourne. The program was produced and directed by Helen Mack. This is Ken Niles inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday at this time to keep your date with Judy. And remember, night and day, at home or away, always carry tons. T-U-M-S. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. All right, that concludes our first episode of the night. Our second episode will start in about two and a half minutes. And, uh, yeah, have a fun break.
All right, that concludes our first break. On to the second episode. Woo! My transcription. I've got a date with you. A big date with you. Oh, you're a big date with you. I've got a date with you. Casting Company presents A Date with Judy, starring Louise Erickson as Judy and John Brown as father. Hello. Hello, Judy. This is Judy. Oh, hello, Oogie. What time will you be over tonight? Uh, about tonight, Judy. But, well, we men were kind of planning on going bowling. Stag, of course. Yes, we men. And I wondered... Of course, if you'd rather I didn't. Oh, dear, you don't have to say another word. Of course I want you to go out with the boys. After all, no matter how glamorous we women are, you men need the companionship of other men. That's right, Judy. Oh! What's the matter? You agreed with me. Well, it's a very quiet evening at the Foster House. Parents and the kid brother Randolph are sitting in the den, peaceful, happy, and contented. Melvin. Yes, dear. Want to go to the movies? Yeah, Humpy Bogart is playing Tokyo Joe. Dora, I'd do anything in the world for you. I'd move mountains and rivers. But. But you don't want to go to the movies. Not tonight. I don't think anything could get me out of the house. It's so nice and quiet and peaceful. <laughs> you turn the radio on in there. Why do Oogie and his orchestra always have to practice in our house? Well, they don't always, Father. They usually practice at Oogie's house, except when his father has one of his headaches. You know how Mr. Pringle suffers from headaches, dear. And I know how he gets them, believe me. Here, is anything? Oh, hi, everybody. Good evening, Oogie. Hello, Oogie. Hi, Maestro. Gee, Mr. Foster, I owe you an apology. Well, I'm glad. I didn't know you were home, or I would have invited you in the other room so you could have heard us better. (laughs) I heard, Oogie. I heard. Well, I got a treat for you now. Judy, in honor of you letting us practice at your house. Yes, Oogie? Oogie Pringle and his high school hot licks will now do a rendition of the song that I wrote especially for you. Oh, no. With vocals sung by Oogie Pringle personally. <laughs> okay, fellas. Come on, everyone. Good night, everyone. Well, Doc, where are you going? I just remembered a previous engagement, which I'll make as soon as possible. Come back here this minute. All right, Oogie. We're all here. Okay, Judy. Oh, stinky. Hello, Jojo. Okay, here we go, fellas. A one, a two. I'm not a wolf, I never flip, I do not twerk. I'm not the least thing I'm not a wolf, I'm just a dreadful little squirt. But there's a beast in me. Well, you know, I 
really enjoyed that picture. Yeah, I just hope he won't got as braver than anybody. Man put out of his own home. Out of his own home. Oh, now, Melvin, when Judy was born, you know we said many times that our house would always be open to anyone she wanted to bring into it. Her friends would be our friends. Her dates are dates. Well, I didn't think she'd be having dates with an orchestra at the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, Dora, we've got to do something about this. Like what? I don't know, but ever since he wrote that song, at least a year ago, I've heard it time and time again. Well, I bet he sings it to her twice a week. <laughs> well, he doesn't write many songs, you know. Well, thank heaven for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't blame him for well, wanting to serenade her a little. Oh. Remember, you wrote me a song once. Yes, I did, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> And you and your fraternity quartet used to come around underneath the dormitory window and sing it to me at least once a week. Yeah, that, that was a song, <laughs> Yes, it was. Yeah, you certainly it? can't compare that with I've Got a Date with Judy. Well, my song didn't sound just like every other song. It, it had some originality about it, some imagination. My song is different. Yes, indeed. I didn't have any corny bunch of hot licks playing it at the time. My quartet was different, too. It yeah. certainly was. And those four boys got a job later, playing in vaudeville. Oh, I'll never forget how excited we were when they got that three-week contract. Dora, that's it. That's it. What's it? That's what the Hartlicks ought to do. Get a job night. So they won't have to come around here. <laughs> if they get some dates, you know, playing around at local dances and stuff, they wouldn't spend their nights here driving me crazy. Oh, oh, oh what an idea. I'm going to suggest the matter to them right now. Hello, dear. Oh, hello, Father. Did you like the movie, Mother? I loved it. Uh, where do we go, Judy? Oh, he and the boys went home. They did? Mm-hmm. And I don't like to say this, but you certainly weren't very charming to them. I wasn't charming to those fine, professional-like performers? To those what? <laughs> Why, I mean, those boys ought to go professional. They're, they're too good to be amateurs. Oh, whoever hears them. Well, I do. Uh, yes, yes, Randolph, you do. But the world, you see, has the world ever heard? Oh, it's true that they play at the high school dances three times a year. But outside of that, what? Well, what should they do? Why, those boys ought to be playing professional dates. They did parties and bazaars and dances. Why, there are loads of things that need orchestras right here in this town. I'll bet you if Oogie went about it properly, he could book his band every night of the week. Father, what a brilliant idea. Brilliant. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why it never occurred to me. Could I have missed it? It's been right here all the time under my nose, staring me in the face. Doesn't that make you a little cross-eyed? <laughs> it's so obvious. Who would be better equipped than Udi to go on the radio? Is the radio? Well, of course. As you said, why should he be wasted? The world should hear him. The world. But, Judy, a person just can't go on the radio uh, helter-skelter just because he wants to. A person has to, uh, has to have a sponsor. Oh, don't worry about that, Father. Udi will get a sponsor. How? Well, there's nothing to it, Randolph. After all, who could advertise a product better than Udi Pringle? Lassie. <laughs> Randolph, you're just too young and immature to understand. Yes, indeed. I know just the man who'll be only too happy to sponsor Oogie Pringle in his high school hot lick. Who? You. you me? <laughs> oh, for the love of heaven. No, no, no. But, Oogie, do you want to waste your genius forever? Oh, no, but Oogie, I... look ahead. You'll start at the radio here, on the local radio station. Then, after a few months, You'll be getting offers from Cleveland or Cincinnati. And then, who knows, maybe New York, Paris. <laughs> you lead a fascinating, sophisticated existence. The friend of great opera singers, the famous composers, the song pluggers. Which would you rather be? A little frog in a big puddle or a big puddle in a little frog? <laughs> oh, oh, <dear. laughs> Why, it'll be the making of you. You'll be famous. I don't want to be famous, Judy. It, it might come between us. Come between us? Well, sure. If I get as successful and fascinating as you say, why, I'm liable to turn women's heads. <laughs> you wouldn't want that, would you? I can face the future unabashed, Ubi. Why cannot you? Because I'm very fond of the present. <laughs> I am willing to risk losing you. 
I am willing to make that sacrifice for the sake of your fame. But, Judy, even if I say I'm willing to go on the radio, I couldn't without a sponsor. I know, I know, and I tried to get you one. So far, unsuccessfully. But I'll succeed ere long. You actually get somebody to pay me for playing? Of course. Oh, by the way, uh, how much would you want for you and the boys? Uh, I don't know. Remember, I... don't make yourself too cheap. One should always hold one's talent dear. That's true, isn't it? How much would you want, Opie dear? Yeah, the... How about $5 a week? Very well. Now that the financial figure has been decided upon, I will now go out and get you a sponsor. And no matter what doors of big, important men I shall have to break down, never fear, I will get you one. No, no, no. But, Father, it was your idea in the first place about Ubi playing professionally. Yeah, but I didn't know that I was going to get stuck with it personally. But think of the opportunity. You can advertise your canning factory. You sell thousands of extra cans as a result. Isn't that true, Mother? That's true, Melvin. Isn't that true, Randolph? Uh... You see, Father, and all it will cost you is the radio time and Oogie. Oogie has cost me too much already. But I can get him very cheap for you. He would be willing to work for you for $5 a week. But anybody else, he would sell $10. Is that so? You see, I saved you $5 a week already. You just tell Oogie to stop raiding our icebox every night and you'll save me another $5. <laughs> Then you'll do it, Father. You'll father, Oogie? No, I will not. The whole idea is ridiculous. I think the people who are related to me are unsympathetic and full of lack of understanding. Oh, now, Judy. Every time I offer something constructive and valuable in the way of something concrete, I get stepped on before the germ of my idea ever gets a chance to bud into blossom. Judy, I, I, I'd like to go along with you on this sponsorship, but... Oogie Pringle? Now, if you could offer Father Hetty Lamar for five dollars a week. <laughs> all right. Run down Oogie all you want. But I will show you. And someday when he's famous, and big sponsors all over the world are bidding for his services, then you'll come to me, Father, on your bended knees. Creaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'll struggle on alone somehow until I get Oogie to the top. But when he is there, I just want you to remember one thing. What's that? Don't try to bask in his glory. <laughs> All right, dear, I won't. <laughs> Don't say, yes, sir, I knew him when. Yes, sir, I helped that lad get where he is. Don't ever say that, Father. Promise. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried that Emerson's hardware shop, Judy? Yes. But what about Henry's Coke and Phosphate Parlor? I tried it. Well, that about washes up everybody, doesn't it? Yes. But I haven't given up yet. I am still going to get you a sponsor. After all, I've still got an ace up my sleeve. You have? Yes. Your father. My father? <laughs> oh, no, Judy. No, I have a suspicion he doesn't think too highly of my talent. Oh, gee, Pringle. If I were you, I'd have more faith in my own father. Well, I had faith in yours, and look what happened. <laughs> we won't speak of my father, Oogie. But my goodness, if your father isn't able to estimate your genius, who would be? Well, I don't know, but it wouldn't be my father. Now, now, now. But, Mr. Pringle... It's a very flattering offer, Judy, but no. You just don't know what you're turning down. Yes, I do, Judy. I know it only too well. Well, Mr. Pringle, I'm very sorry you feel this way. You're making a big mistake not sponsoring Ruby, but I'm going to make him a success in spite of you. Well, I, I can't help but admire your spirit, Judy. It's all right, Mr. Pringle. Don't be unhappy. I'll manage without you. Uh, Judy, I, I was just wondering, if the hot licks are on the radio, uh, I wouldn't have to turn it on, would I? Turn what on? The radio. Well, no, if you didn't want to. And if Oogie and the boys had a job on the radio, uh, maybe the local station would let them do their practicing there instead of here at my house? Why, I guess it would. You know, it might be worth five dollars at that. <laughs> oh, Mr. Pringle, I knew you'd come through. I knew it. I knew if anybody would be able to see Oogie's genius and talent, you would. Yeah. Well, I did it. I did it. You did what, dear? I got Oogie a sponsor. 
You did? You really did? Yes. Why, that's wonderful. Wonderful? It's a miracle. Well, how did you do it, Judy? Oh, it was nothing at all. I merely made Ogie's price a little cheaper. Cheaper than five dollars? Yes. Uh, the sponsor won't have to pay him anything. Well, that's cheaper, all right. <laughs> he was going to pay Ogie five dollars at first, but when he found out how much the airtime cost, he was forced to cut Ogie's price. Of course, there are one or two other minor drawbacks, but I'm sure in time they'll be overcome. Drawbacks? Such as what? Well, the contract with his sponsor is for only one week. He hopes by then somebody else will take the mess off his hands. I mean, uh, that somebody else, uh, richer and more wealthy than himself, will be able to pay Oogie what he so richly deserves. He wouldn't want to stand in the boy's way. Well, of course not. So the whole thing is on a temporary basis, of course, but I know oh, that after... Oh, boy, just think. For a whole week, Oogie and his high school hotlicks are going to be busy every night. Oh, not every night, Father. Yes, not every... No, every morning. Every morning? Yes. Morning time on the air is cheaper than evening time, and of course, the sponsor had a limited budget. When did the program, dear? Tomorrow morning. What time? I certainly want to be listening. Five o'clock. <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning? Uh-huh. It so happened that that was the only time the radio station had available. But they promised me that in a week, if we had a permanent sponsor, they'd move Oogie to a much better time than 5 a.m. Oh, they did? Yes. They're going to have 6 a.m. available. <laughs> You promised to help me. Well, I was out of my mind at the time. <laughs> now, Ubi, this is the fourth time I phoned you, and you simply got to get out of bed and stay out of bed this time. This is not Ubi. And I know it's the fourth time you phoned me because I heard it ring every darn time. And I'm not only going to stay out of bed, but I'm going to come over to your house and complain to your parents, Judy Foster. Oh, Mr. Pringle, it's you. Yes, Mr. Pringle, it's me. I, I, I didn't mean to wake you up, Mr. Pringle. Oh, you didn't, did you? No, it's in the contract. You don't have to listen to the program. Judy, do you realize you've awakened my entire household, including my wife? And you know how my wife is in her waking moments. Do you realize? I, I'm sorry, but it's 4.30 and Ubi's got to be at the radio station in time. Please, Mr. Pringle, is he dressed yet? Yes, he's dressed and in the kitchen eating breakfast in his sleep. Well, tell him to hurry. And, Mr. Pringle, promise me you'll go right back to sleep. I wouldn't want to break your contract for anything. Back to sleep. Now, she tells me. I'm so wide awake after four phone calls, I can scream. Not only that, but I think I will. Ah! <laughs> program, would you? Yes. Father. Oh, please don't put your head back under the covers. The least you can do when a personal friend of mine is on a citywide hookup is listen to him. Why? Mm. Oh, please don't put your head back under the covers. The least you can do when a personal friend of mine is on a citywide hookup is listen to him. Why? Mm-hmm. Oh, hard for me. I went on the radio station with him. Father, it's your responsibility to keep Father awake during the program. I've got to run. All right, dear. Good night, Dora. I'm going back to sleep. Now, Melvin, wake up. This was your idea about Oogie going professional, and you're going to suffer through it just like anybody else. <laughs> I couldn't write a better one than that. And that was a little number entitled, I've Got a Date with Judy, played by Oogie Pringle and his high school hot licks, written by Oogie Pringle, arranged by Oogie Pringle, sung by Oogie Pringle, and conducted by... Oogie Oogie Pringle. Pringle. (laughs) Oh, Melvin. Now, this is Oogie Pringle signing off for now. Good night. 
morning. Now, Dora, may I please go back to bed? <laughs> now, Melvin, the show wasn't so bad. No, no, nothing that a bottle of sweet air couldn't fix. Oh. What did you think of it? I thought it was marvelous. Sensational. Father? Ooh. <laughs> Father. You didn't like it, Mr. Foster? Oh, now, don't worry, O.G. He was just in a bad mood because he had to get up so early to listen. Randolph, did you do what I told you to? Yeah, and I'm sure that nobody in town will ever speak to me again. Why? What did you have Randolph do? Oh, I had him call up all our potential sponsors before the program this morning and remind them to be sure to listen. Randolph. You woke them at that hour of the morning to listen to Oogie? Yeah. You know, I heard some of the most interesting remarks I ever heard in my life. <laughs> well, I should think so. Do you think any of them listen, Judy? Of course, Oogie. Why, every businessman in town will be clamoring for you. Yeah? If you wait. Pretty soon that phone will start ringing. We'll have more sponsors and we'll know what to do with. <laughs> and when I walk down the street, people will say, there she goes. That's the woman behind Oogie Pringle. Oh, Judy, I wouldn't let you walk behind me. <laughs> Oogie, I mean that people will realize that it was I who pushed you forward. Oh, you'll be rich, fabulously rich. Oh, boy. Oh, no, no, look, kids, I don't want to be a wet blanket, but... I don't want you both to have your heart broken, either. What do you mean, Father? Well, I think you're wrong to build Oogie's hopes up like this. When no one calls to buy the program, he's going to be pretty disappointed. Father! Honey, I don't mean to be unkind. I just don't want you and Oogie to expect something that won't... Well, I happen to be a pretty good judge of what the public wants in the way of entertainment. And much as I hate to say it, Oogie's show simply isn't what the Oh, no, I get it. Want... Hello? Yes, it is Judy. What? Really? 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 Oh, it's wonderful. Goodbye. Who is that, Judy? That was Mr. Emerson. He wants to sponsor your program for his hardware store. Oh, boy. Well, that's wonderful. Well, Father? Ed Emerson, huh? Well, he was never very bright. <laughs> oh, I'll get it. Hello? Yes, this is Judy Foster, manager of Oogie Pringle and his high school hot licks. Oh, yes, I'll be in Canada to discuss it with you. Yes, this afternoon at three. Thank you, goodbye. Who was that, Judy? That was Mr. Sam Briston. He wants to sponsor you for his moving picture cameras. Well, I'll be. <laughs> well, I don't know, Mr. Hibble. You see, we've had so many offers, I just... Very well. I'll be in Canada to discuss it with you. Yes, this afternoon at four. Thank you. Goodbye. Who was that, Judy? That was Mr. Hibble. He wants to sponsor Udi for his plumbing store. He says he's willing to plunge. <laughs> yes, Mr. Braun. I'm sorry, Mr. Braun. I wouldn't think of letting you cut Udi's price. Oh, no, Mr. Braun. I know Oogie very well, and he wouldn't mind a bit paying a big income tax. <laughs> very well. I'll be in Canada to discuss it with you. Yes, it's afternoon at five. Thank you. Goodbye. Who was that, Judy? That was Mr. Braun from the Morris Meat and Vegetable Market. He wanted to give Oogie rutabagas instead of money. <laughs> hmm. Rutabagas, huh? Yes. But I don't like rutabagas. That's what I told him. Oh, isn't this the most exciting day of your life? Yeah, boy, do I feel snazzy. Well, come on. We've got a very busy afternoon ahead of us transacting these business deals. And, Oogie, when I'm transacting, please don't speak. Just sit there looking aloof and talented. All right, Judy. Well, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, dear. Good luck. Have a good time transacting. We will, Randolph. Goodbye, Father. Uh, wait a minute, Judy. Uh, yes, Father? Uh, 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 could I uh, speak to you uh, privately? Of course, Father. Well, I'm very sorry, Father, but you're much too late. And besides, I warned you you were passing up a terrific thing. You did nothing of the kind. You hardly gave me a whack at it. Moreover, you deliberately put on the darn program at a time when I was scarcely awake to listen to it properly. Well, that's true. But... I have a right to that program. It was my idea. If anybody's going to sponsor it, I am. <laughs> 
Hardware, indeed. Plumbing, vegetables, rutabagas. But people who buy cans, now that's something different. All right, Father, if you really it's want It's a deal, Judy, it's a deal. The Boston County Company will sponsor Oogie Pringle. Just a minute, uh, Father. You've forgotten one thing. What's that? The financial arrangement. The uh, uh, financial Yes. Thing? Oogie's price has gone way up since this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, dear, you, you've forgotten one thing. You see, I'm, I'm your father, and, and daughters never take advantage of their own fathers. Father, dear, uh, you're the nicest father a girl ever had for a father. But until we get the financial discussions over, I've never seen you before in my whole life. <laughs> Dora, wake up. Oh, all right, We haven't yeah. very much time. Come on, Randolph. Wake up, wake up. Oh, all right, Come on, the program will start in just a few minutes. These hours will be the end of it. Did you turn the radio on, Dora? Yes, yes. Now, let me see. I want to make sure you got the right station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it. <laughs> you know, I'm a little nervous. The Boston Canning Company, quarter hour. Be quiet, everybody. Here it is. Here it is. My daughter, Judy, will be back in just a moment. But I thought you might be interested to know what Mrs. Foster and myself have taught our children about religion. Our nation was founded on faith in God. And we know that freedom to worship constitutes a precious national heritage. Faith stabilizes a family and holds it together. We think a family which attends its church or synagogue is a happier family. And now I think I hear Oogie driving up. <laughs> I know I hear her. <laughs> The door fell off. Oh, that's all right, Judy. What are cars to me? Pretty soon I'll be able to have one for every day in the week. Oh, yes, Oogie. And maybe two on Sunday. That's all right, darling. And I've got you to thank for it. Oh, Oogie. If you hadn't made that wonderful deal with your father, where would I be? Just where would I be? Well, even though he is my own father and related closely, I tried to make a good financial arrangement for you. And you did. Boy, imagine getting a thousand a week. Yes, isn't it wonderful? There's only one thing. What am I going to do with a thousand cans? This program is transcribed. The name of Judy is written by Elaine Leslie and stars Louise Erickson as Judy and John Brown as father with Myra Marge as mother and Dick Man as Uzi. Johnny McGovern plays Randolph, Fred Howard was Mr. Pringle. Music was composed and conducted by Buzz Adlin. The program is produced and directed by Ella Mack. This is Al Fangley inviting you to be with us next week at this same time to keep your date with Judy. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. That concludes our second episode of the night. Hope you guys enjoyed. And on to the second and final break. Woo!
that concludes our final intermission. And now on to the final episode of A Date with Judy. Here we go. I've got a date with Judy, a big date with Judy. Oh, jeepers and cheese. I've got a date with Judy, and Judy's got one with me. The Revere Camera Company, famous for leadership in home movie equipment and the friendly camera dealer in your community, invite you to enjoy A Date with Judy, starring Louise Erickson as Judy and John Brown as father. Hello. Oh, hello, Judy. Yes, Father. Uh, will you tell your mother I might be very late for dinner, dear? I've got to go to an important meeting at the Kiwanis Club. An important meeting? Uh-huh. You see, Saturday, November 19th, is National Kids Day, and we're trying to raise every dime we can to help the underprivileged youngsters in this town. Oh, Father, you're the nicest father a girl ever had for a father. Well. <laughs> That's Judy Foster, folks, the lovable teenage girl who's close to all our hearts. Well, it's evening at the Foster house. Judy, her parents, and her kid brother Randolph are at the dinner table. Melvin, I still don't know what kind to get. Why, aren't washing machines all alike? No. Some are much more attractive than others. Uh Speaking of attractive men, Sylvester Monroe is irretrievably the most attractive man I ever saw for a boy who isn't too good looking. (laughs) Well, who was speaking of attractive men? We were talking about attractive washing machines. Oh, Who's Sylvester Monroe, Judy? The new boy. What new boy? Oh, Randolph. Don't you ever hear anything about anything? No. Sylvester Monroe is just the boy that every girl in town is mad about. I'm not a girl, and I never heard of him. Well, I'm a girl, and I've never heard of him either. He just moved here from Texas, Mother. And do you know that the moment I saw him in my ancient history class, I looked at him alluringly? Uh, how, how, How do you look at a boy alluring? Oh, you sort of lower your head and look up at him through your lashes. You know, the double whammy. The double whammy? Yes. It makes a boy ask you for a date. Didn't you know that, Father? No, I never knew that. Did you know that, Dora? I wish I had known it when I was in high school. (laughs) Life would have been much more interesting. (laughs) Well, you know now. It's too late. (laughs) Well, I should think so. Just let me catch you giving someone the double whammy, that's all. Oh, Melvin, you know I wouldn't give anybody the double whammy, but you. (laughs) I hesitate to make a positive statement of this nature, but yes, I might as well make it. I think he's wonderful. Who? Sylvester. Whatever happened to Oogie Pringle? Yes, yeah, whatever happened to... Sylvester is six feet four and has red hair. He's very unusual. He sounds unusual, but uh, uh, whatever happened... And I have a date with him tonight. He's going to take me dancing at the Cannibal Club. Judy, for the third and last time, what happened to Oogie Pringle? To Oogie? Yes, to Oogie. Father, you know that I'm very fond of Oogie. He's a dear, lovable lad. But he doesn't take me dancing. He takes me for granted. Oh, I see. I have given him several of my best years. And what have I to show for them? What? Old age. Exactly. (laughs) I am no longer a girl. And when a girl is no longer a girl, she is a woman. And when a woman is a woman, she wants to be treated as such. Such as? Such as the way Sylvester treats me. He's got the most beautiful manners. Oogie wouldn't think of opening the car door for me. Sylvester not only opens the door, but he bows, too. Oh, he bows, huh? Yes, and he makes the most beautiful speeches. Oogie wouldn't think of telling me that I look hauntingly lovely like Sylvester did. <laughs> he wouldn't, huh? No. <sighs> he just tells me that his carburetor leaks. <laughs> I see. Do you think I'm being unfair to Oogie? After all, he too has given me several of his best years. Oh, yes, indeed. I've often heard him say he has quite an investment in you. It's just that I must find out now whether or not Oogie is destined to be my mate. And the only way that I can find out is to go out with Sylvester and compare. Right with Eversharp. How do I look, Mother? You look...
look divine, dear. Father? Hmm? Oh, very nice, honey. Randolph? Well... Never mind, you always tell me the truth. Now, <laughs> let's see, what should I be doing when he gets here? Should I lean gracefully against the piano, or should I recline demurely on the sofa? I want to startle him. Then why don't you stand on your head? <laughs> Randolph, kindly keep still. I'm as excited as though it were my first date. Of course, it is my first date with Sylvester. What have you done about Oogie tonight? Oogie? Oh, well, I merely told him that I was going to stay home tonight and wash my hair. Well, why on earth didn't you tell him the truth? And hurt him needlessly? Oh, my goodness, you'll have to tell him sometime. Oh, no! When I go out with Sylvester tonight, I may discover that his inner soul is quite different than his outer soul. So? So I may not like him. I shall then return to Ubi who will be in good condition because he won't have had to suffer the pangs of jealousy needlessly. Oh, for the love of heaven. <laughs> Women think of everything, don't they? I'm just being kind, that's all. Oogie is in blissful ignorance. Oh, there's the doorbell. That must be Sylvester. I'll open it. Judy! Judy Foster! Oogie! So, you're washing your hair tonight, are you? Well, all I've got to say is take your fit shampoo along when you go to the cannibal club tonight with Sylvester Monroe. Yes, sir. Blissful ignorance. <laughs> but, Oogie... A fine thing. Women are all alike. All of them. I thought you were different, Judy. But at heart, you're just a, a woman. A regular Samson and Delilah. <laughs> oh, Oogie, I... Mother, speak to Oogie. Hello, Oogie. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Foster. Uh, Mrs. Foster, how could you let her do it to me? Well, really, I... And you, Mr. Foster. Uh, good evening, incidentally. Huh? You're a man, Mr. Foster. How could you let her do it? Well, well, Oogie, you see, Explanations I... will get you nowhere. <laughs> and let me tell you something, Judy Foster. All is over between us. What? Yes, sir. When I walk out of this house, I will walk out a free man, master of my own fate, captain of my own ship. Never again from this moment forward will I so much as lift an eyebrow for a girl. From now on, I'm a, a bachelor. I walk out of here a hard shell. Ogie! As a matter of fact, <laughs> I like it this way. No responsibilities, no worries. I can just concentrate on my leaky carburetor. <laughs> and one more thing. Yes, Ogie? Don't think I'm jealous, because I'm not. I feel nothing. Absolutely nothing. Get that Sylvester, I'll kill him! I'll knock his black off! I'll punch him right in the nose! Oogie, okay, please! Just let him stick his nose through the door! Just let him so much as inch over the threshold! Just let him! Oh, my! I'll smash him to bits! To bits! Father, what'll I do? Uh, now, Oogie, okay, maybe, maybe you'd better... Oh, don't worry, Mr. Foster. I'm not gonna make any scene in here. I'm gonna invite him outside. Open the door, Judy. All right. Then I'll smash him to bits! To bits! <laughs> Uh, hello, Sylvester. Good evening, Miss Judy. And now that you're in, I... Hey, boy, are you big. <laughs> Aren't you Oogie Pringle, sir? Uh, yes, yes, this is Oogie. Uh, Sylvester, I'd like you to meet Oogie. Oogie, I'd like you to meet Sylvester. Well, I'm mighty pleased and honored to make your acquaintance, sir. Hi. Now, there's something I'd like to have a little... Uh, Friendly conversation with you about. Oh, I... uh, Sylvester hasn't met mother and father yet. Uh, mother, this is Sylvester. How do you do? Uh, Miss Foster, ma'am. Uh, now I know where Judy gets her beauty. You. Well. <laughs> and uh, this is my father, Sylvester. Glad to know you, son. Well, I'm mighty pleased to know you, Mr. Foster, oh. sir. And Randolph, my brother. Howdy, partner. Uh, howdy, Mr. Randolph. <laughs> Won't you sit down, Sylvester? Well, thank you, ma'am. And now I'd like to you know... You know, I'm pretty thrilled to meet Oogie here. Oh, you are, are you? And may I inquire why? Well, I had the privilege and pleasure of watching you play football yesterday. Oh, well, now I'd like to know... I don't know what your team would have done without you. I've never seen such passing anywhere. And you're a mighty fine goal kicker. Well, I'd like to know that... You think so? <laughs> Well, if you're not all American someday, yeah, my name isn't Sylvester Monroe. <laughs> well, I never played football much. A track was always my fort. Yeah, I understand you're pretty fast. Oh, uh, well, oh, the women, maybe. <laughs> I wish I had your ability. Oh, uh, that's enough about little old me. After all, you came over here tonight to take out Judy. Yes, yes, and it's getting late, so... Excuse me, Miss Judy, but... Oogie, 
If I may call you, Oogie. Oh, sure. Would you care to come along with us tonight? Yeah, we'll make it a threesome. Well, I'd like to, but I wouldn't dream of intruding on your date. Oh, I wouldn't consider it intruding. I'd consider it an honor. Oh, I couldn't. Well, I insist. You do? I insist. Yeah, and I expect to have you as my guest. Old Southern hospitality, huh? Well, I won't permit it. You be my guest. I guess we Northerners know a thing or two about hospitality ourselves. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't permit that. I insist. Why don't you all go Dutch? Yes, that's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll settle it later. Uh, well, Miss Foster Mim, uh, it was a delight and a, and a privilege to make your acquaintance. Yeah, and you too, Mr. Foster, sir. Yeah. What about little old Master Randolph, sir? Uh, in honor. Uh, ready, Miss Judy? Oh, yes. Uh, allow me to help you with your wrap. Oh, uh, no, allow me. Uh, sorry, Oogie, but I've already helped her into it. Well, she can take it off again. <laughs> good night, everyone. Good, good night, night folks, and have a good time. Uh, do proceed me, Oogie. Oh, no. You proceed me, Sylvester. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, what do you know? Morning, everybody. Oh, morning, good morning, sweetie. Morning, How dear. was it? Did you have a nice time last night? Well, Sylvester was charming. <laughs> he certainly charmed the vest off Oogie. <laughs> Did you ever see such a change in a person's attitude? Oogie sure ran the whole gamut of emotions, didn't he? Oh, Oogie was awful. Horning in on Sylvester's date like that. What do you mean, horning in? He was enticed in. It was dreadful of him. And he let Sylvester pay for everything. Well, you were right, Judy. Sylvester certainly is unusual. <laughs> I'd like to stay and add my habitual kind of witty comment, but uh, I've got to leave for the office. I'll walk out to the car with you. Okay, come on. Bye there. Bye, Judy. Have Bye, a good father. day, Melvin. Mother. Yes, Judy? I'd appreciate it very much if you'd give me your advice about something. Well, I'd be glad to, dear. Is it about Oogie and Sylvester? Yes. Last night wasn't a fair trial. Sylvester couldn't give me his undivided attention with Oogie there. I still don't know the real he... Uh, don't you think I owe it to him to give him another date? Well, I... After all, what right is Oogie to cling to me like a, a clinging vine? If Oogie should happen to meet a glamorous girl, somebody the equivalent of Sylvester in a feminine way, of course, I wouldn't stand in his way. Well, you... I gracefully retreat. I wouldn't force myself along on dates with this theoretical glamorous girl, would I? Well, not as long as she stays theoretical. I don't care what Oogie says. He can writhe with jealousy. He can punch Sylvester in the nose. But I am going out again with Sylvester, no matter what shape his nose is in. Well, now, if... I shall tell Oogie immediately. Thank you for your advice, Mother. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, Judy, I understand. You do? Of course. Why, you didn't even have to ask me. You won't be jealous or anything? Jealous? Of a fine fellow like Sylvester? Of course not. I trust him with you. You do? A gentleman like Sylvester? Why, it'll do you good to know him better. It will? Sure. Uh, just let me know when you have some spare time. Uh, wouldn't you sort of feel like you were playing second fiddle? It would be a pleasure and an honor to play second fiddle to a true blue friend like Sylvester Monroe. Besides, it's just a little northern hospitality. Even hospitality can be carried to extremes, Oogie. And not when the object of your hospitality is footing the bill. <laughs> Oogie, Pringle, I think you're terrible. Well, of course, when I permitted him to pay the bill last night, he agreed to permit me to treat him next Thursday night. Oh, you won't mind if I take Sylvester to a stag party and buffet dinner next Thursday night, will you? Stag party? Yeah. No, why should I mind? Well, goodbye. So long. Oogie! What's the matter? You bowed! Evening, Miss Foster, ma'am. Evening, Sylvester. Ready, Miss Judy? Ready, Sylvester. You mighty fine knowing you, Miss Pringle, ma'am. And you too, Mr. Pringle, sir. Uh, ready, Oogie? Ready, Sylvester. Uh, 
How are you feeling tonight, Mr. Foster, sir? Oh, I'm just in the pink of condition. <laughs> well, gratified to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Mighty gratified. You ready, Miss Judy? Ready, Sylvester. Judy. Hi. Uh, how are things? Just snazzy. I, uh, don't have a thing to do this afternoon. I mean, I have a little free time, and I thought that... Yeah? Well, I thought we could go to Henry's Coke and Phosphate Parlor like we used to. Oh, gee, I'd love to, Judy, but I can't. You can't? No. I've got a date with Sylvester. Oh. (laughs) Everybody. What's the matter, dear? What is it, dear? How can Oogie sit by and let somebody else take me away from him? Oh. <laughs> Just because he likes and admires Sylvester is no reason for him to let Sylvester go out with me. <sighs> I never was so insulted in my life. And now, if you'll both excuse me, I'm going upstairs to my room. And I may not come down again for years. <laughs> How do you like that? Women. <laughs> What about men? Men? Not that I care in the slightest. But my, Melvin, sitting there last night making goo-goo eyes at that silly woman at the party. I did not make goo-goo eyes. I have no intention of discussing it, but my gracious... You'd have supposed everything you said was the wittiest and cleverest thing in the world... The way Roxanna kept laughing. Well, it just so happened that I did say some pretty funny things last night. Well, <laughs> not that it matters in the least, you know, not at all. But no matter how I felt about a man, I certainly wouldn't be so obvious about it. I, anybody in the room could see that she was wild, simply wild about you. Oh, she wasn't wild, simply wild about me. <laughs> he, uh... She merely found me uh, amusing and uh, uh, brilliant. (laughs) She acted wild about you. You really think so? It was pretty apparent. How could you tell? By the way, she snubbed me. (laughs) Now, now, Dora, that's a mean thing to say. Just because the poor girl happened to take an interest in me momentarily... Girl? She was a girl when I was in rompers. (laughs) Now, Dora, she's only 32. She told me so herself. Dora, can I help it if I inspire confidence in people? If they feel the urge to speak to me as to a a sort of a a spiritual leader? There's no reason for you to be jealous. No, then. Are you implying I'm jealous of Roxanna Kramer? Well, Well, because I'm not. I assure you, I have no intention of ever giving her another thought. Well, good. (laughs) Sorry if I said anything provoking, dear. Oh, 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 that's all right, dear. It was just uh, a human. Well, I've already forgotten all about her. I don't even remember what she looks like. Well, I don't either. (laughs) (laughs) Melvin, you're sweet. I kind of am, aren't I? (laughs) We never fight, do we, dear? Never. I think she dyes it. What? Her hair. (laughs) Nobody could get that true, naturally. I go for the love of heaven. Mother, I need some more advice. (laughs) Well, I'll try to be some help, dear. What should I do? What? Do you think it would make Oogie overconfident if I gave Sylvester up? Overconfident? Yes. If I stopped seeing Sylvester without Oogie asking me to. I see your problem. I could tell Oogie that the only reason I'm giving Sylvester up is because of Mitzi. Mitzi? Yes. And it'd be the truth, too, almost. Mitzi is mad, simply mad for Sylvester. She hasn't even been able to look at Elmo since she met him. I wish that would happen to me. What? But I couldn't look at Oogie. But it's worked the other way. All I can think about now is Oogie. Really, dear? Sylvester is charming and everything, but I guess I... I really don't want to be treated like a woman. No? I just want Oogie. He's so wonderful and real and and foolish. (laughs) I know just what you mean, dear. Mother, do you think if I told Oogie that on account of Mitzi being my most bosom friend, I must stand aside and make the big sacrifice, 
Oogie would accept it without feeling too superior? It might work. All right. Now, I only have one other problem. I don't want to hurt Sylvester. What'll I tell him to get rid of him? Well, I ought to be able to help you on that. I got rid of your father once. Mother, you didn't. I did. Yes, I did. I hadn't been going with him very long when I decided that he wasn't for me. So I wrote him a nice little note. A note? Yes. And it got rid of him beautifully. As a matter of fact, I had a terrible time getting him back a few days later when I decided I'd made an awful mistake. Really, Mother? And you know, I think I still have that note. Your father gave it back to me, and I kept it all these years as a lesson to myself. Well, could I see it? It would help me compose something suitable to write to Sylvester. I'll get it for you, dear. I know just where it is. Hi, everybody. I'm home. Hi, Father. Hello, Randolph. Oh, where's your mother? I don't know. She was here about an hour ago. Yeah. wonder where she went. Oh, there's a note on the table. She probably had to run to the store or something and let... Let me see. Dear Melvin, just a note to say that though I respect and admire you... <laughs> Rather formal for a lady running out to go to the grocery store. <laughs> though I respect and admire you, under the circumstances of what happened last night... Last night? What's the matter? Last night. I think it's better that you and I part. <laughs> huh? Oh, look, I have Yours truly, Dora. Why? Wow. What did I do last night? I told that silly woman, Roxana, a joke or two, and she laughed, and... Oh, my. She must have laughed awfully hard to get Mother so mad. How could Dora have grieved? Why, how could she have thought... And, and I thought she forgave me. She, she said she forgave me. Oh, boy, I'll have to testify in court. <laughs> in court? Oh, my heavens. I assume you'll contest the divorce. The divorce? <laughs> what did I do to be tossed aside like an old shoe? Give somebody the double whammy? Nobody could have construed it as a double whammy. Nobody. I guess Mother did. Oh. <laughs> dear. Hello, Judy. How are you this wonderful afternoon, Father Dearest? Awful. Just awful. What's the matter with Father Randolph? He's been tossed aside like an old shoe. <laughs> oh, how silly. Nobody would toss Father away. Not my adorable angel face Father. Why are you so happy and mushy? <sighs> Oogie and I have reconciled. Aren't you thrilled? I'm brimming over with joy. <laughs> now I've got to write to Sylvester. Uh, Randolph, did you take Mother's note? No, what I... What did didn't... you say, Judy? Well, I just said that Oogie and I have reconciled. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. And what are you talking yeah, about? About what you said. That's what I said. Oogie was glad to get me back again, as long as it wasn't hurting Sylvester's feelings. About the note, the note, the note, the note, the note. <laughs> oh, the note. Do you have it? Yes, I have it. What do you know about it? What, what, what? What, what? Well, don't you remember it? <laughs> Mother got rid of you once with it a long time ago. A long time ago? Yes. Not today? No. She wrote it 20 years ago. <laughs> she did, huh? Feel a little better, Father? Oh, Randolph, did you think for one minute that I was worried? Yes. <laughs> Stop talking like a child. Huh? I remembered that old note all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How do I look, Mother? How do I look, Father Randolph? You look wonderful, dear. Oh, Joy, a date with Oogie at last. Now, what shall I be doing when he gets here? Shall I be sitting down, talking on the phone? Oh, suppose you stand up and answer the doorbell. All right, I can't wait. Hello, Oogie, dear. Hi, Judy. Evening, Miss Judy. Sylvester. Yeah, I thought I'd bring him along and make it a threesome. Mother! Judy will be back in just a moment. And now, here are Judy and the men in her life. Well, Miss Judy, 
Now, what picture would you like to see? There's a triple horror bill at the Bijou. And no, Oogie, I'd like to see all the King's men at the Globe. Hey, but Boris Karloff and Peter DeLore and Bella Lugosi... Oogie, are... the picture I want to see is from a book that won the Pulitzer Prize. But Boris Karloff and Peter DeLore and Bella Oogie, Lugosi... Oogie, are... where are your manners, sir? My manners? Yeah, Miss, Miss Judy is the one to decide. Oh, oh sure. Oh, excuse me, Judy. Say, Sylvester, I just happen to remember. There's an old picture playing at the Strand that's all about Texas. Well, I don't carry... Texas? <laughs> well, let's go to the Strand. Uh, no, Sylvester. Miss Judy, I'm sorry, but I've got to be firm about this. Texas is calling. Goodbye, Sylvester. Yeah, hurry or you'll miss it. Yeah, goodbye, ma'am. <laughs> goodbye, Oogie. Texas... Here I come. What's so funny? Oh, nothing. Just a minute. Oogie Pringle, what picture about Texas is playing at the Strand? Well, ma'am, I don't know how much it has to do with Texas, but it's called Stella Dallas. <laughs> hope you'll join us again next Thursday, same time, same station, for another Date with Judy, written by Aline Leslie and starring Louise Erickson as Judy and John Brown as father, with Myra Marsh as mother, Dick Crenna as Oogie, Johnny McGovern as Randolph, and Sylvester, Bob Easton. The program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. It's 8 o'clock at KECA, AM and FM, Los Angeles.